Okay, now let's go back to where we were. Oh, we're still screen sharing. Okay, so what I think I'll do, this used to give me a way to can it, but I can't do it now. Okay, let me do it this way. Should have nine people. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Okay. I can't get this off the screen. Oh, there it goes. Now I can. Okay. Okay. Now, finally, we're ready to get started. Um, if you notice all those moving parts, what happened is I only have five minutes, less than five minutes between the two classes. I had to run downstairs for something. I forgot to close the screencast-o-matic for the last class, so I had to do that so I could start it for this class. And so that's why part of that interruption was. Sorry about that. But now we're recording, so we're ready to go on this class. Do y'all have any issues, concerns, problems, questions, anything before we get started today? Oh, wait, here's Thomas coming in. So let me get Thomas here before you answer that question. Okay. Top part of the alphabet seems to be, okay, something just fell. I don't know what it was. I can't see it, but anyway, maybe it's. One of y'all had something fall. Okay. Any questions, concerns, issues, problems, anything to discuss before we get going for today? Anybody? All right. I guess not. So let's get started where we left off last time. Well, before we do, let's just talk about how today's going to go. Now, I'm trying to recreate last week, and it's such a blur in my mind. I know that Wednesday was almost a complete disaster, not complete, but awfully close to it. Um, and for any of you who were here today and weren't here Wednesday or tried to get in Wednesday and couldn't, I don't know what happened. Uh, the best I can figure, and I believe this is probably true, my last class ends, it, it's a two hour and 55 minute classes, but Zoom only lets me do 15 minute increments. So I have to make that a three hour class. Of course, three hours for that class ends at 2.30. This class starts at 2.30. And even though I clicked start on the right screen, I think Zoom must have thought I went back into the last class. Everything indicated I was in this class, but it must have put me back in the other class. That's the only semi-logical thing I can figure out that may have happened. And I was sitting there waiting for anyone. Everything was correct. I had the right class. I had everything. Not a single soul in sight. So what I did, I waited a little while. Then I went to blackboard to make sure the announcement and the um, uh, invite went out properly. I went there. Sure enough, everything was correct. At that point, only five of you had even acknowledged the announcement. So I went back waiting for those five to, to, to come into the class. And while I was waiting, I graded papers and I probably lost track of time, but nobody showed up. So I quit and went back again and checked everything went back to blackboard and then i saw that y'all were sending messages back and forth some of them to me most of them to each other trying to find out what had happened and that's where i saw someone said yeah it says he's in another class i went back and checked i was in the right class so i got out of that class and went right back to the same screen and got right back in it and at that point roy was the only one still in the in the class but he wasn't there. His name was just there. So I admitted him, but he had stepped aside because he got tired of waiting. And then slowly other people started coming in. And then if I heard when I saw that you were on the 
uh, chain of messages. I counted you present there, and since then, when I found out you had tried to get in, couldn't, I counted you present. But the thing is, we just had a very limited class. So we finished chapter 18, I think it was, and then we got started in chapter, <clears throat> no, I'm sorry, we finished chapter 20, yeah, finished chapter 20, and then just barely got started in 23. Now, I don't know if we would have had time for the lab for 20 anyway, but I sent both pieces to you last week. Um, the one piece was the um, PDF file, and one piece was one that I had typed up. So that's what we're going to do our last two hours today. So we're doing chapter 23 from now until 4.15. At 4.15, we'll stop and do the lab for chapter 20. Sound reasonable? Okay. All right. Now, again, even though we stop at 4.15 and start, I can't count roll again until 4.45. So y'all stop me at 4.15. So we'll stop 23 and get started in chapter 20 and get started in the lab for 20. And then we will at 4.45 stop me again and I'll call roll again and then we'll move on from there. So uh, let me just make sure last time I checked there were three. So we should have 10 students now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let me make sure that's what we got. Yep, I'm counted as number 11. Okay. Any questions before we get started? Either what we're going to do or how we're going to do it or anything such as that. Uh, let me say just a couple more things while I'm setting up for current slide. Now this, of course, is one of my best classes ever. And guess how many papers I've gotten in from this class? Zero? zero research papers and guess what folks you only have one weekend left we're going to meet for class monday and wednesday uh but wednesday is technically finals day so really you need to have your research papers in by monday okay now well, that gives you one week so please get working on your papers i had at least somebody i think in this class or one of my classes says well, what's the paper about anyway? I said, ah! We went over that the first day of class. It's out there on Blackboard under whatever they call that main thing. Uh, it's not central or it has some that content. That's what they call it. Blackboard content. There's one of, the, I think maybe the second icon in it is on research paper instruction. Okay. It may be third. Somewhere in there. You'll see that research paper instructions, everything spelled out there for you. But if you want more than that, go to the first YouTube video. Now, the title for that video is syllabus for this term. OK, go to that YouTube video, which you also find through content. Uh, click on the link that says YouTube video. It takes you there. Find that video that says syllabus. Click on that. And you'll hear me go through the syllabus if you want to fast forward, you know, whatever it is to get to the place where I'm talking about the research paper. Listen to that. I go into gory detail about the research paper. So all the questions you should have there, I think I probably will answer there. But if you come up with any more that I don't attack, you know, approach in one of those two places, ask me, please get those research papers in. Now, I was sort of happy on this, but a little dismayed. I got caught up with all my grading, I thought, until last night when I was uh, just checking messages and I printed a few more things that came in over the weekend, more than I was expecting. And then this morning I was hoping to grade those things and I got in more than twice as much since. I didn't get a single paper graded. Number one, I had to call the dean, and when I got on the phone with her, that went way too long. Uh, and then the associate dean called me, and that didn't take very long at all. But between those two phone calls and, and printing uh, papers and answering emails, too, there went my whole morning. Entire morning, I didn't get the greatest single paper. 
Okay, so I won't have any time until after 6.30, 7 o'clock tonight. I'll try to get a few of those graded then. And I didn't get them all, all printed. There's still some out there on um, whatever uh, my email that I didn't even get a chance to print because I got tied up with the dean and the associate dean. So I've still got more to print. Then I'll get to grading. But boy, I was so proud of myself. I finally got everything caught up grading until that happened. And now I'm behind again. So I'm glad that y'all are getting the things in. But the, then again, please get any back labs. In fact, I started getting my first lab threes, you know, the moon lab. I got at least, I remember, three or four of those in. Haven't had a chance to grade them yet, but I did get some of those in. Thank you very much. And then several people got old tests in and um, and a few old labs. So thanks for turning them in. Get everything else done this week or this coming weekend because next week is it. Um, I think the last day of class is Thursday. And that's when you, I'll give you your test, the final test on Wednesday after class and try to get it back to me Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but I have to have it by Sunday evening because grades have to be due, I think are due in by Monday noon of the following week. So please try to get everything caught up by then. Get your research papers in by next Monday and everything else in by the following, well, all the back stuff in as soon as you can, but your last, the final exam will be in, due in by, um, you know, I'd love to have it before Sunday night is over with so I can get them graded before I have to have grades in. All right, any questions on any of that? That probably took way too long to say, but it was important to get it said. Okay. Now, where we left off last time, we had started Chapter 23, which is weather and climate, and that's exactly how we're doing this. Weather first, and then climate the last part of the chapter. We talked about clouds and precipitation last time, and now we're on cloud forming processes here. If you're following in the book, this is on page 575 if you got the big book. If you have the smaller book, it's probably listed as 23-3. Okay, next to the last chapter, the third page in that next to the last chapter. So here's what's going on, folks. Clouds form when air masses are cooled to their dew point. What in the world does that mean? Okay. For those who weren't here last time, let me take you back just a little bit. Okay. We started with the hydrologic cycle, I believe, pretty much, or somewhere pretty close to that. What happens, most of the earth's surface is covered by ocean, like 70% or something like that is covered by water, okay? And the sunlight hits the water and evaporates the water and the water vapor goes up into the air, okay? Now, if it goes high enough into the air, the higher you go, the cooler things get. Now, last night before I went to bed, I went to put the dog out and it just felt a little bit like a sauna outside, okay? Um, it wasn't that hot. It didn't feel that hot, but it didn't feel comfortable. So when I came in, I glanced over at the thermometer, and sure enough, it was only maybe less than a degree warmer outside than what it was inside. But the humidity outside was 90%. Now, what does that mean? That meant the air... You know, the molecules in the air are generally fairly far apart, okay? But they're there, okay? You always have air to breathe anytime you breathe. So when I say far apart, compared to their size, they're relatively far apart. But they're really packed in there, but they're so incredibly tiny. But the air will only hold so much water vapor because then basically most of the pore spaces in the air, the places that can hold it, are holding it. Okay, so when it was 90% humidity last night, that meant the air could not hold that much more moisture. 
And then when I came in this morning, I happened to glance over at the windows before I even went downstairs on the east side of the house here, and it looked like it had been raining all night because there were, the, the windows had water all over them. I was like, what? And I looked, and it wasn't nothing dripping off the eaves and things like this. And then I realized, wait a minute. The temperature dropped, maybe only a degree or two last night, but as the air gets cooler, it can't hold as much moisture. Because, remember, as temperature goes up, the molecules tend to get a little further apart, okay? So it can hold more moisture. But when they cool, they get closer together, and now those water molecules are in the way. And that's why this morning we had a heavy dew. That's what was on my windows. It was dew drops, okay? Nothing falling off the eaves. They hadn't rained any, but there was just water accumulated on the on the windows, okay? On the outside. Okay? Also, my wife said, "Yeah, there's a dense fog in some areas." And we didn't see it here, but it was fog. What that meant, the air had all of the moisture it could hold. So what a fog is, is a cloud that's right on the ground. So the clouds form when the air masses, that moisture that's gone up into the atmosphere, and somewhere up there it starts getting cooler. And now the air that can support all this moisture here, when it gets up there in that range where it gets cooler, they tend to come together when they reach their dew point. The dew point is the place where you get 100% humidity, the air can't hold any more moisture, and now it starts condensing, okay? The water droplets, the water vapor becomes little water droplets, and that's what clouds are, little water droplets. That's what fog is, little water droplets. Dew is where those little droplets have actually landed on your windows, on the grass, on the ground, wherever. That's what dew is, and that's why they call it the dew point. That's where the moisture comes out of the air. Now, generally the air is cooled by upward movement, but it's not always. Part of it is. Now, why does it move upward? Warm air is less dense, so that warm, moist air moves up because it's less dense and then cools off, and that's where the, that's the cooling going up into the atmosphere. Convection is what rises that, allows that warmer air where the molecules are further apart because they're less dense, they rise up, the cooler air comes down. Okay, that's convection. The other way they cool is that when the prevailing winds, which are most of the time west to east, most of the time those prevailing winds will take it off the ocean to a continent somewhere like our west coast. And if you think about what we said about the west coast, we have some pretty tall mountains just inland from our west coast because of the plate tectonic thing, the volcanic mountains and stuff there, the Sierra Nevadas, the, the Rockies are further in. But you know, these are right there on or near the, the west coast. Well, if suddenly that moist air hits mountains, which are way up there, then they that causes it to condense. The cooling is called by the mountain ranges, barriers that keep the moisture from coming in at such a high, such a high elevation. The other reason they, it comes out, the cooling happens when colliding air masses occur with different densities. So, and I know you probably heard the weather people talk about a cold front. And we're going to talk about this later in the chapter, but here we're hitting it the first time, colliding air masses. So let's say this air mass was up there over Canada, and it started coming south. And that warm air mass coming in off the Pacific hits this cooler air mass, and now water droplets start forming. So there's the second, the third way for cooling to occur. A warm, moist air mass hits a cooler air mass, different density, and now you get some condensation, cloud forming processes. The cloud formation depends on the atmospheric stability. Now, 
this is one thing in this chapter I don't feel like the book does a super good job of describing. Now, I think I told you all last time, the uh, usually the lab we did for this chapter when we were on campus, we'd go to the Channel 13 Weather Center, and Jerry Tracy or one of the other meteorologists would host us and take us through and tell us how they predict weather and that kind of stuff. That was our lab. I didn't have to make up a lab. We just went there. That was the lab. It was totally optional, uh, but as many people could came, you got a 25 automatically just for going. And then you got to ask questions. You got to react, interact with the people. We can't do that anymore because of COVID-19. So I'm going to have to come up with a lab that hasn't been developed yet. That's my problem. But that's probably going to be, if we finish early enough, that could be Wednesday. Otherwise, it'll probably be Monday for sure. But I'm hoping we'll finish before then and maybe have time for it on Wednesday. I've got to come up with a whole lab for this chapter. Okay, that's my issue, not yours. But anyway, while I was saying that, Jerry Tracy gave a much better description of what atmospheric stability is all about. But let's first look at theirs, and then I'll sort of tell you how Jerry made it, to me, much simpler. Okay, here's what we mean by atmospheric stability. Now, remember, we have parcels of air that are being lifted. Now, if that lifted parcel of air is cooler and denser than the surrounding air, now, this is the part where this description doesn't really make a lot of sense, but it's okay. It's lifted, but it says it's denser. My question is, why would it be being lifted? Let's ignore that for a moment, because that's a little, oops, 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 here comes David. He, he was here before, so I guess he either had to leave or got booted out, but I'm pretty sure he was here before. Yeah, I already had him here, so welcome back, David. Okay, so this lifted parcel of air, if it's cooler or denser than the surrounding air, then it just naturally falls back into where it belongs. Doesn't cause an issue. Okay, that's called a stable atmosphere. Okay, now, on the other hand, what if that lifted parcel of air is warmer and less dense than the surrounding air, then it tries to keep moving upward. Okay, and it will keep trying to move upward through that surrounding air and as it does that it sort of speeds up as it goes okay that's what causes a, an issue okay we'll see it a little bit later they have some decent visuals there these are not quite so good but these are called thermals where the lifted arsenal parcel of air is warmer, less dense than surrounding air, so it just tries to keep going up. And that's what thermals are. If you've ever watched a hawk, a seagull, a buzzard even, just have the wings out there and seem to be flying along without ever flapping the wings, they're basically riding the thermals. They're in that jet of air that's moving upward that keeps them aloft they don't have to even flap their wings. They just hold them out there and it carries them along. They're called thermals because warm air rises. Thermal convection is really what's going on. Now, here's the part. I think it's the part. Oh, it's not moving. I've got to go back here. Okay. All right. And again, <laughs> this is, to me, not the clearest illustration, but here's what we've got. The, here is increasing temperature on the horizontal scale as you're going across this way and increasing altitude as you go up this way. Here is the parcel of air, okay? Now, it's trying to rise, or it was rising, uh, its temperature is here, which is less than the temperature of the surrounding air. So since it's less, it tends not to want to go up very fast. In fact, it tends to slow down and come back down. That's a stable atmosphere, okay? The 
temperature of the parcel uh, is less than the temperature of the surrounding air, so it was rising, it just stops and becomes stable wherever it wanted to be. may even come down a little bit. That's a stable atmosphere. On the other hand, if the temperature of the rising partial is greater than the temperature of the surrounding air, then it wants to just keep rising because its temperature is greater, it wants to just keep going up. That's an unstable situation because it's moving up, meaning other air has to come down and take its place, and you get sort of a a motion going on here. Okay? Now, uh, the way Jerry Tracy sort of described this, and I thought this was sort of funny, and I can't say it as well or as clearly as he did, but Jerry is just an average sized guy. But he said, what if someone, he held up his hands and someone put, and he gave this illustration because this was back at my time, and his, we're within probably five years of age of each other, he said someone put Arnold Schwarzenegger on his hands. Okay, do y'all know who Arnold Schwarzenegger was? He was, yeah, okay. He had been a Mr. Universe at one time. He played Conan the Barbarian and several other things, the Terminator and some of those things in some of those really high quality movies, okay, or maybe I'll like them, it's fine, uh, you know, and he actually became governor of California, okay, uh, California sort of loves celebrity, and they've had a couple of actors as governors before, okay, but he was that, but he was huge, he was a big man, he had been Mr. Universe, okay, probably easily 250 pounds or more, he was tall and big, and Jerry said, if I was trying to hold Arnold Schwarzenegger up, that's not a very stable situation, okay, he's going to want to, uh, you know, I can't, that's just not stable, whereas I held maybe a baby up or something like that, that's stable, it's not going to be a problem, so what an unstable situation is, is where you have too much movement going on, this air is going up, other air is coming down, anytime you have vertical movement, you probably are also going to have circular movement. We'll talk about that a little bit later. That's an unstable situation. But when that parcel of air is actually cooler than the surrounding air, it doesn't get uplifted very far. It sort of stabilizes there at some place, and that's a stable situation. Okay? Now, that's trying to... Yes. Okay, that's that's an excellent question, but wait, let me get Parisa in here. I think she was here before, but I think she must have had, either got booted out or she had to leave for a moment. Yeah, Parisa was here before. Okay, she's back. Welcome back. Okay, your question was, does the cloud sort of just stay in place? And the answer is kind of yes. I don't know if you're sitting somewhere where you can look outside today. Uh, but I'm, I'm looking out my window here, and there's not many clouds. That's usually a sign of stable atmosphere. And those that are, are fairly horizontal, okay? Not too thick. The ones I'm looking at, you know, sort of thick, but not too bad. Uh, that's a fairly stable-looking environment. If they were very thin clouds, just little streaks across the sky, that's a very, very stable situation, okay? Yeah, that would be the case. Now, an unstable, usually you have way many clouds, and they go really deep uh, because that's, sh yeah. What were you going to say? Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah. I don't know exactly what the name these I'm looking at today. They're not, they're, okay, there's several kinds. The cumulus clouds are the tall ones. Those are the thunderstorm cloud. Okay, we don't have that today. Then you have, I guess, stratus and cirrus. That was last chapter, the chapter that we didn't do, the one we skipped. Um, 
if you have a thick book, you can go back and read chapter 21, and that will answer some of those questions. They don't talk about stability so much. They just name the types of clouds. But the stratus, the uh, cirrus, the stratocumulus, anything that's in, like you said, stratus, sort of horizontal, flat, uh, you know, not very deep clouds, that usually indicates a fair, or no clouds would indicate a fairly stable atmosphere. But when you get those really thick, deep clouds, that's because of that instability. That moisture has been carried up, cooling off, and that's where you get problems. Did you have something else? Yeah, yeah, and that, that, that's definitely, any kind of a cell like that is unstable. Supercell is super unstable, right? Yeah, you got it, okay? We'll see a little bit more of that coming up, okay? Now, I can't get it to advance. Let's try it again. Here we go. Now, this is sort of continuing what we were just looking at, the upward mobility and the moist air. That rising moist air cools, eventually reaches its dew point, okay? When that happens, the clouds start forming. Now, the droplets, okay, the moisture that was, okay, water vapor is a gas. It's not a liquid. It's a gas. The water molecules are out there individually as water molecules. When they go up and eventually cool, now they start getting closer together, less energy, and then they sort of start sticking together. As soon as they do that, they start becoming little droplets, okay? They're now technically individually little liquid droplets, okay? Now these droplets condense around something called a condensation nuclei. It could be just about anything. Very fine particles of dust, okay it could be salt particles uh, crystals any kind of crystal that may have been drug up into the air for some reason or another dust um, I guess he say again one more time bear say again okay that, I was just going to say that it could be I thought you said barium which is one very specific chemical but um, I would say pollution type chemicals, okay, like hydrogen sulfide or, or you know, something like that that might be in the air, soot, um, you know, uh, particles like that, you know, sort of your, your pollution forming things, okay, those could be the condensation nuclei, and that's why they call it smog. It's kind of like fog, which is all only water droplets, only it's surrounding these pollutants that are in the air, and they call it smog. And you'll have that happening. Not enough to cause rain, because they're just, there's just so many things for them to attach themselves to. And then sometimes that would be later, if it does rain, acid rain, things we talked about uh, before in the last chapter, okay? Now that cooling of the rising air is actually slowed because when, okay, now think about this and I think it'll make sense to you. How do you get water to go from liquid to being water vapor? Yes, you heat it up. It gets more energy and it goes up. So it's gotten more energy to become water vapor. Now as it's rising, and cooling and starts condensing, now it's losing energy. So if it's losing energy, it doesn't have as much as it did going up. So the cooling of the rising air is slowed by the release of that energy. That's called latent energy. They're, they're assuming you had chapter four already. You have a, a couple of you may have, but most of you have a Latent heat is hidden heat. That's the hidden heat of vaporization, which is when you heated the water, it, you heated it to 100 degrees Celsius if you're boiling it, 
and then when it starts boiling it starts changing to water vapor but it's still at 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. You don't see the temperature go up the added heat is going into the vaporization process. So then when it's going up and cooling it's losing that heat of vaporization, the latent heat, the hidden heat. Even though the temperature is not changing that much that's what caused it to happen, but it's losing its energy. And that uh, the, the, the rising air is slowed by the loss of energy. Now, as you get more and more of these little bitty droplets coalescing around these condensation nuclei, then as they get thicker and thicker, they become clouds. Okay, so I'm looking out there and the cloud I was looking at is basically dissipated gone away but I see a couple of others from down here they're very pretty white clouds which basically tells me they're pretty high clouds because the sun over here slightly to my west is shining on the clouds and reflecting off of them that's what I'm seeing but if they were very dark clouds that means they're lower it's the same cloud if you were up above it in a plane it would look white because the sun is above it then and the only reason they look dark is because there's so many droplets there it's blocking the sunlight so the clouds really don't change color it's just how much light is either being reflected off the cloud or coming through the clouds and that's what gives them that appearance okay so huge number of droplets that's what a cloud is so that's the cloud forming process this is the bottom line after the those little bitty droplets condense around the condensation nuclei if you get a big enough collection of those droplets then you have a cloud kind of like we talked about the things in the first couple of chapters when you're forming stars that masses of gases you know that um, nebula uh, that were out there when they get close enough together they start coalescing on each other and that's when you start the star forming process sort of the same thing only not nearly as energetic is happening with the cloud forming process okay now we're moving from there to origin of precipitation now before we get there 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 are these two examples a parcel of air with a volume of one cubic kilometer, which is a huge volume, contains and then it gives you how much water vapor. And it's a pretty large amount, uh, about 1,600 kilograms, which would be more than a one and a half metric tons of uh, water vapor, but that's a huge volume. A cubic kilo kilometer is a huge volume. Um, it rises to an altitude where all the water in the parcel condenses and what change of temperature well that's assuming you've had chapter four which you haven't had but if you're interested in just the relative looking at the numbers it's a pretty interesting problem to go through so I'll let you take a look at that just to see what's happening the bottom line is uh, and you have to there's all sorts of these assumptions what change of temperature does that partial have it drops about 4.7 almost 5 degrees Celsius would be awfully close to uh, 8 or 9 degrees Fahrenheit so and that's why oh it happened what day was that it was yesterday wasn't it that we had that intense thunderstorm come through was it that yesterday did y'all get hit by that we lost power for hours, I think. Did y'all have it? Forty-five or four two five? Forty-five, yeah. Did y'all lose power? <laughs> right. We lost power. We lost just about everything. It was. <laughs> Uh, we had heard the storm was coming, so my wife held off. Um, she was going to make some peach preserves. And uh, she said, well, it's going to storm, so I don't want to be 
in the middle of making those when we lose power. The storm came through, you know, it was pretty fierce. I mean, the thunder and lightning was incredible. And in the rain, it rained hard. But after a while, it quit. I think even the sun may have come back out. And then about the time she was <laughs> had been uh, cutting up the peaches, there went the power. Not a drop of rain anymore. I went outside and looked around to see if a line came down or something. Nothing happened. She called Alabama Power and the whole area was out for hours. Okay. So uh, I thought I heard my phone, but it must not have been. But anyway, uh, so we were there making peach preserves. No air conditioning. <laughs> we had gas rain, so we were able to keep making them. But boy, it got pretty warm in there, you know. But then finally, uh, I can't remember what I was doing. Uh, oh, yeah. The uh, dishwasher latch had broken. So she had gotten the part in. She said, well, let's start working on that. So I went down to turn off the power. So I didn't want it coming back on when I had the wires exposed. And when I came back upstairs, the lights came on. So I was glad I had it off. But anyway, uh, we had already finished everything. Finally, it came on. So we were able to cool off a little bit. But yeah, but then what the amazing thing was, the reason I started the whole story was that Afterwards, it had been, I think, like 91 degrees before that rain. It dropped more than that 5 degrees or t 9 degrees, 8 or 9 degrees there. It dropped considerably. And uh, when I went out to see if any lines were down, it was just barely above room temperature, except the humidity was <laughs> close to 100%. Okay, so anyway, origins of precipitation there on page 577 if you've got the old the big book uh 23.5 if you've got the little thin book okay so what are what do we mean by precipitation anyway does anyone know what the word means to precipitate basically means to fall okay if you think I don't know if any of you have ever done any reading about glaciers and things like this. They call sometimes the precipice something you could fall into, okay, that you have to be careful you don't fall into a precipice, okay? That's precipitation, to fall, okay? That dew on the window this morning was not precipitation. It didn't fall out of the sky. It came out of the water vapor that was in the air at at, at ground temperature, at, at, on the ground. It was not precipitation. Precipitation is water returning to the earth from up high. Dew and frost, and we don't think of frost at this time of year, but dew and frost are not, their surface processes, not precipitation. Precipitation would be rain, hail, snow. Basically, that's it for precipitation. Now, if you remember when we were talking about um, processes in the last chapter or two that we talked about, where we talked about chemical weathering, when two chemicals come together and something comes out, that's called a chemical precipitate. Same term, it falls out of the chemical. The, the solid falls out. It wasn't there before, suddenly it comes out. Same deal, anything that falls out. Precipitation forms in two ways okay one way is those cloud droplets up there okay get closer and closer together and then they collide and then they get to be heavier droplets and they keep doing until coalescing until finally they get so heavy they can't stay up there anymore and they fall and you might think isn't that what most of our rain comes from and the answer is no, okay? Most of our rain comes from the growth of ice crystals. Remember that warm, moist air moving up into the atmosphere? As it gets higher and higher up there, it gets cooler and cooler until actually that's no longer water droplets, it's ice crystals. 
and those ice crystals keep growing as more and moist air comes up and gets around them and they get heavier and heavier until they start falling. Okay. What time of year do you usually get hail? You know you get snow in the winter time. When do you usually get hail? When the weather report came over on our weather, whatever you call it, alert, you know, it said severe thunderstorms are in the area, blah, 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 blah. These are capable of producing large size hail. This is summertime. This was 90 degrees out there. What is ice doing coming out of the sky? It's because that upward movement was growing ice crystals as it went up and got bigger and bigger until finally the upper flow of air couldn't hold them anymore and here they came crashing down. Now most of the time our thunderstorms, <laughs> those raindrops were, were ice crystals that got so heavy they started falling. If you ever noticed right at the beginning of a summer rain, some of those drops, have you ever been driving down the interstate or on a road somewhere and those first drops hit your windshield? They almost scare you to death because that big old, you know, just hits the windshield out of nowhere. Big old drop. Why was it so big? That was an ice crystal. Big old chunk of ice. Probably a hailstorm stone somewhere up there, way up in the atmosphere, but as it fell, it melted. But all those were staying together. It was a big, heavy raindrop by the time it hit. Now, later in the rain, they get smaller because, you know, you know things. But that's what most of our rain is, is melted ice crystals. They come from so far up, as, as Roy was saying, those really tall clouds. If they came out of those clouds, they were ice crystals up at the top of those. Believe, yes. Yeah, supercell. Okay. So, yes, exactly. And we'll we'll talk about the formation of those a little bit later. Right now, we're just looking at the raindrops. Where did the raindrops come from? It uh, reminds me of the B.J. Thomas raindrops keep falling on my head. That was in what uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Y'all don't remember any of that, do you? But never mind. Okay. The coalescence process. The first one of those. That takes place in the warm cumulus clouds near the tropic oceans. Now we may get some of those here because we're in sort of subtropical area, but no, these are mostly those rain showers. Okay, uh, when I was first in the Navy, I had been in Navy ROTC and took some midshipman cruises, but after I got my commission and went into the Navy, they flew me out to Guam to wait for my ship to come from the Philippines, and they were going to pick me up in Guam, and then we were going to go on from there, and that happened. But when I was on Guam, which is in the tropics, I would go out, uh, they put me in a BOQ way up in the middle of the island, no transportation, I had to pay for taxis if I was going anywhere. I was just in, hadn't even got my first paycheck, so I didn't have lots of money. I wasn't going to spend on taxis. I had nothing to do, really. I had nowhere to go, so I would just take off and go on walks. And my goodness, when I got just about as far as I was planning to walk that day and was about to turn around and go back, here would come a rain shower, okay? It happened at least once a day. Some The only days it didn't rain once a day is when it rained twice a day. I mean, they just, these warm cumulus clouds near the tropic ocean finally get so heavy, they just rain. And they just rain. And they just rain. It was about like the summer, it seemed like almost. It just about every day we get a shower. And it never failed. I say, okay, well, I'm not going to go as early today. Well, never happened. So, well, I just need to get out and move. So I got out and moved. Then here came the rain once a day if not twice a day okay now sometimes that contains the clouds go around and they say giant these aren't giant salt condensation nuclei they're just little crystals of salt that sort of got drug up when the water was evaporated off the ocean the 
and moving upward, it carried a few salt crystals with it. They wouldn't normally have gotten up there, and not enough that you would taste it, but just a few salt crystals get up there, and then they're hanging around, and then things cool off. Those form the condensation nuclei. That's mostly in the warm tropics. That's not where we live. The ice crystal process takes place in clouds in the middle latitudes. That's where we live. Now we're close to the tropic, but not that close. 23 and a half degrees north is the tropic of Cancer. We're 33 or so north. Yeah, 33 or so north. So we're a good 10 degrees or awfully close to it out of the tropics. So ours are more ice crystals. Okay. The ice crystals capture nearby water molecules. They grow as they're up there really cold. They form bigger ice crystals and bigger. Now, if it's winter time, that's what precipitates. We don't ever see that. We mostly get the rain in the winter time. Those ice crystals have melted on their way down. Uh, in the summertime, they were ice crystals, always rain. Except for those like Roy was saying, in the supercells that get drug way up there. And there's such an updraft of air, they get held up there by that forces going up and keep growing bigger and bigger. And then when they fall, they don't have time to melt completely. And that's what hail is. In the middle of summertime, that's why you have ice falling out of the sky. They come from those supercells that go so far up there, the ice crystals get so big and they fall so heavily, they don't have time to melt on the way down. That's what hail is. And you'll notice they're always at the first of the, the uh, storm. You don't usually see hail far into a rain. It happens early. And then the rain falls and usually melts them pretty quickly. Okay. Is that your experience? Yeah. When do you see hail? Early in the rain or late in the rain? Early. Always early. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Now, the almost the end of page 577 in the big book or 23-5 is section 23.2 weather producers. What causes this weather? Now here's the idealized model. It happens this way kind of most of the time, but it's not strictly lined up this way. If you picture 10 degrees north of the equator and 10 degrees south of the equator, that's where the Earth gets most of the direct solar energy, right there, because that's the biggest part of the Earth. That's where the atmosphere to, for the solar energy to come in goes through the least amount of atmosphere because it's coming directly through that uh, not obliquely but directly through that receives more direct solar energy there the air heats up and as it heats up it rises now if it goes far enough it has to go one direction or the other either goes north toward the north pole or south toward the south pole who knows what makes it goes which way, but it rises and spreads toward the poles. Now what that happens when that's happening is that you have low pressure right around the equator. And what is low pressure right around the equator form at this time of year? Yet, yeah, well, starting with tropical depressions, and then they become tropical storms, and then they become hurricanes. And that's exactly why, because at this time of year, uh, in the northern hemisphere anyway, in that 10 degrees north, it's really a lot of energy right there. And that's why we get, this is hurricane season, okay? That's happening. The air heats up, rises, spread to the poles, low pressure then, and then later, the air cools, becomes more dense as it rises, and then sinks back to the surface. Guess where? Latitudes 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south. Where are we? 33 degrees north, approximately. 33, 23, 45, remember? 
we're 33 degrees north. I'm a little further than that because I'm not in Bessemer right now. I'm in Birmingham, but not far off, okay? Uh, sure enough, just about every time in one of my other classes, physical science classes, uh, when we're doing thermometry, uh, I have the students check the barometric pressure. And it just baffled me the first few times why we we're always right at or above normal atmosphere of pressure. And that's why, because that's where the, the, the uh, air is sinking back down. Even though we're elevated above sea level, that should make us less, you know, but no, we're right at uh, one atmosphere of pressure or even a little greater. So what's the end result? Band of low pressure near the equator, bands of higher pressure right around, where do we live? 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south. We're at 33 degrees north. Now, as this is happening, air is moving up and away from the equator and coming back down around 30 degrees north or south. You get large convective cells formed to equalize the pressure. Okay? There's again your cells. You were talking about super cells. This could evolve into that. But these are cells that try to equalize those pressures, changes of pressure. That's one of the biggest driving forces in weather, pressure gradients. And that's why, what do they show on the pressure, on the weather maps? They show the areas of high pressure, low pressure. These are areas that, and then what you have where those lines are close together, just like when we did topographic maps, if those lines were close together, that meant you have large elevation changes really soon when the barometric pressure lines, the uh, isobars are close together. That means you have a large pressure gradient very close together. That's when you get your most winds is trying to equalize. Those are the large convective cells trying to equalize those pressure differences. Okay. Now, that leads to a concept we call the air masses. And believe it or not, we sort of already talked about these. These air masses are large, fairly horizontally uniform bodies of air. Okay? What we mean by that is everywhere in that body, for pretty good thickness, the moisture levels, the temperature conditions are pretty close to the same. So this whole big body of air is at fairly close to constant moisture and temperature conditions. Okay, You have four main types of these air masses, and these kind of make sense. The first of these are called the continental polar air masses. Okay, And these are the ones that come over land, that's why they say continental, from either way north if you're in the northern hemisphere or way south if you're in the southern from the poles coming into the say the temperate or the uh, tropical areas okay so for us that's mostly coming from Canada so sometimes you'll hear them called Canadian air masses they are continental polar air masses they're coming over land that's the continent part and they're polar, meaning they're colder masses of air. Now, I don't know if any of you remember, I think I mentioned this in an earlier class, I'm guessing this was about six, seven years ago, we had what they called a tropical, no, a polar vortex. It seems like it may have been about February or March, but came down, it may have been, what's that? Exactly. That was a very much a continental polar air mass. Came down, I mean, it was massive and it was strong and it brought some incredibly cold temperatures, probably the coldest temperatures we've had in that decade uh, by far. It brought them way far south. Okay, further north, I mean, they hit record low temperatures for that day, those days. Those are continental polar air masses. Now you also have maritime polar. These are again coming from the poles but coming off water. 
maritime means water. And these would be the ones over here coming off the Pacific, the North Pacific coming down here, the North Atlantic coming down here. Uh, these maritime polar uh, usually, well, they're, they're going to make things colder, but they also have a large amount of moisture because they're coming out of off the waters. The continental polar may not have large amounts of water in them, but they still can cause you problems. Now, I don't know if you've ever read much about the Northeast or heard it talked about, but they quite often, especially those people who lived along the coast there in Maine and New Hampshire, you know, and around in there, they call them the Nor'easters. They don't pronounce all their syllables. The Nor'easters. They're coming from the Northeast. They're maritime polar. They're cold. They're stormy. When it just, you got some really big problems if those nor'easters come in. Um, we have some really good friends who live in Italy. We actually hosted their son his senior year of high school. Uh, he went to Altamont High School, which is just up Red Mountain from where we live. And uh, he was born in the U.S. when his dad was a, just finished his uh, doctoral program over here. He was in the same program my wife was in. They were really good friends. We were friends with, you know, he and his wife and me and my wife, we, uh, we did a lot of things together. They were a fun, fun couple. Uh, and uh, then after he finished his doctorate, they moved up to Boston. He worked there for a pharmaceutical company for a year or two. While they were there, their son was born. So he was an American citizen, okay? Neither of the parents were, but he was. So then he's a really bright kid, too. Found out later his parents were really bright also, his dad especially. Uh, but anyway, he... Uh, he was doing really, really well in school, so they wanted him to have the opportunity, since he was dual citizenship, well, the family moved back to Italy, okay, um, but they wanted him to have the opportunity to come to study in the U.S. as well as if he wanted to stay in Italy, he could still go there, but they felt like it would improve his chances if he graduated from a U.S. high school. So he came over and, and lived with us his senior year so he could graduate here from a U.S. high school really really bright kid and a lot of fun we had a, a good time with him but anyway we went over and visited them in Italy when my wife had professional meetings over there uh, we went to visit and they live in the very northwest corner of Italy northeast corner of Italy you know where the boot sort of has a, a curl in it up there that's where they live in Trieste it's almost more Austrian than it is Italian okay it at one time was owned by Austria, but, you know, after one of the wars, it went back to being Italy. So anyway, we were up there, and there was this one place they showed where their nor'easter came in, but it wasn't maritime polar, it was continental polar. That was called the Bora, which means cold. It came from Russia, because if you go northeast from Italy, you go right toward Russia. And that's where they got their really awful, awful storms coming in. They were continental polar storms, but they were still very powerful storms. And again, that was a seacoast town, and they said when those came up, the wind was strong enough to take vehicles, push them off the road into the water. I mean, just lift them and carry them into the water. And that you watched, and they watched for, if they ever had those coming, they say, get off the roads, especially the roads that are near the bay. You don't want to be there. That's right on the Adriatic Sea. They said, get away. Do not be driving during those things, because literally they were that strong. So that's continental polar, maritime polar. The last two are continental tropical and maritime tropical. So again, these are continental coming off land. That would be for us in the U.S. coming off Mexico. Well, that's the only continental area we have south of us. But maritime tropical would be coming off the Pacific here around San Diego. 
It would be anything coming off the Gulf. This is what our big weather makers are. Or anything further to our east coming off the Atlantic. Maritime tropical, maritime tropical, continental tropical, or maritime tropical here too. Now again, the maritime, especially these, will be loaded with moisture because they're coming off tropical areas, warmer, warmer air masses, and containing lots of moisture. Whereas the ones coming off Mexico are warm air masses, but very, very dry. And guess what you have here in Arizona and New Mexico and some of West Texas, and even over here in the Eastern California? Deserts, because most of their air mass movement is coming off of continental uh, tropical, dry, hot air. And that forms all the deserts in New Mexico, Arizona, like I said, some in eastern Can uh, California. The Mojave Desert is here. Um, West Texas is almost dry enough to be called desert. I mean, it's, it's pretty dry there. Okay, so those are your air masses. Now, these air masses quite often dictate what they call air mass weather. And that sort of makes sense. The weather conditions remain the same over several days as these air masses are dominating the situation. Okay, the weather changes, however, when a new air mass moves in or when the air mass conditions acquire local conditions and they stop being tropical and become temperate. <laughs> okay, you know, they, they get normalized. Okay, now we'll see kind of how those are happening. Okay, what you have, the boundary between the air masses are called the weather fronts. And I'm pretty sure if you listen to the weather anytime, you're here. There's a cold front coming. There's a warm front coming. There's a stationary front sitting over us. There's this, that, or the other thing. These weather fronts are basically the boundaries between air masses. You may have had, this is very typical, uh, especially in the wintertime, those continental polar air masses from Canada come down, drop our temperatures. Uh, either we had warm moisture from the Gulf there on top of us. When these come down, sometimes we can have some really bad storms. Uh, that's our major chance of ever getting snow. Okay, Or the vice versa, they could have been sitting there a while and the warm tropical air mass, tropical uh, maritime air mass comes in off the Gulf and starts pushing that up and then you're going to have some more pretty active weather. So a cold front is when the the polar air masses are pushing the tropical air masses out of the way. The warm front is when the reverse, the tropical air masses are pushing the polar air masses out of the way. Okay, the boundaries between the air masses are at different temperatures and where those different temperatures are you have different density gradients, you have different pressure gradients, all kinds of differences, that's where usually your storms occur. Okay, so the cold front, when the cold air mass moves into and displaces the warmer air upward, remember what do we call that? Unstable situation. And that's what happens, especially in the winter time, when that cold air comes down over we've been sitting here with pretty warm moist air sitting over us really enjoying ourselves that cold air mass comes in you can have some really bad storms and temperature drops like crazy uh, leading to large cumulus remember thunder clouds the cumulus are those real deep thick ones that form the supercells on the other hand, the warm front is when the warm air masses advances over a cooler air mass, but again, you get that unstable situation. But with the warm air mass going over a colder one, uh, usually the, the, the gradient is not as great. 
long, gently sloping front, front, I can't talk, the clouds and rain may form in advance of the front, but usually they're not, oftentimes not quite as severe. And then the stationary front is when the forces influencing the warm and cold masses become balanced and the front sits there. It may move a little south or a little north, a little to the east, a little to the west, but basically sits there. And that's when you have those day after day after day of rains or storms or whatever. That's usually a stationary front. So let's look at the graphics for those. First, here's a one that shows the pressures. Notice a low pressure here, high pressure there, high pressure there, high pressure here. This is dominated by the highs. There's a very weak low here. There's only, I only see those two lows on the whole map. But this is being dominated by high pressure. Um, and you'll notice there's not many lines very close together at all. The lines are called isobars, meaning same barometric pressures. This, as you go from this line to that line, you know you're going down because you're going from high pressure to low pressure. When you're going from here to there to there, you're going up in pressure because this is your low pressure here. See, this low here is very weak low that don't have very many lines very close to it. This one's a very strong low. I'm guessing that's a nor'easter, okay? Because look how close the lines are to each other. That means you have a lot of pressure difference in a very short area. It's very short lineal distance, meaning the winds are going to be really strong there. And low pressures in the northern hemisphere rotate counterclockwise. High pressure rotate clockwise, okay? Remember that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. This is almost a slide out of place here, okay? But if you'll notice this, here's your high, not a very strong high, but rotating clockwise wind, noticing it's pushing air this way, okay? Your low pressure is counterclockwise, so its winds are here. This forms a front between those two air masses. This is a maritime uh, polar maritime, this is a polar, a continental polar, so not a lot of change of temperature, but you do have quite a bit of change of other conditions, okay, as in moisture content and stuff like that, okay. This would be your strong clock, a counterclockwise flow of air. This is where you're going to have I don't know if they call them supercells up there, but they're going to be pretty close to it. Large wind gradient here, okay, because of that pressure gradient. So you're going to have very strong winds coming from the northeast, and that's bringing in very cold, but maybe moist conditions. This could be, in the wintertime, produce major snowstorm here all up and down the coast here. In the summertime, very major uh, rainfall events, colder temperature too. And you see from this low, you have counterclockwise flow. So this is pushing a cold front down here, pushing that warm air out of the way. This is a much weaker um, low. So it has a little bit of a warm front here, but this one dominates and has a cold front there. Uh, on the back side of this low, you have another cold front pushing down here because this is warm moist air here. This is continental polar air here coming in behind this low. Probably not too polar condition. Here is your high pressure here, not a very strong high at all, so very weak clockwise flow of air, a little bit stronger here but not producing any kind of front here because they're similar temperatures. Up here, though, this high clockwise flow here produces, is bringing in your continental polar up here against whatever was here before, and so you have sort of a cold front forming here, okay? Not a rain producer, though, because this is dry air before it, uh, 
coming after it and probably pretty dry air on this side as well. Over here, your clockwise flow is pushing warm but dry air up this way and the clockwise flow here is dragging it up here. So this is sort of a warm front. Not a weather producer, not, not going to produce much rainfall, but it would be there. So you see the study of these, the fronts are where the boundaries between the air masses and the uh, pressure differences dictate which way the, the air is flowing. Okay. I sort of jumped the gun on the flow because they showed this and without telling you much about the, the, the cells, I threw that in. We'll see more of that. Here, though, is the better picture of the fronts. Here is the cold air mass coming in. Now, this is the side view. Here's the top view. The side view is this cold air mass is pushing its way in. Warm, moist air was here. It's getting forced upward. Unstable situation. This is, could easily be a pretty strong weather maker, okay, meaning rainmaker, because it's pushing the warm, moist air up the front. Unstable situation. When you have the upward movement like that, you get rotation, okay? Now, from the top view, it's pushing this way. Um, it doesn't show me a lot there, except there is your front. You see the front along here, like you saw on the weather map. Uh, your front is sort of vertical here. Uh, you don't see that on the weather map. This would be your uh, the line that you would see, and having those little arrows pointing out of it, that would be your front. Now. Here, the cold air mass moves into, displaces the warm out, upward. The moist rising air is cool, leading to large cumulus and thunder clouds, usually right um, at the front and slightly lagging behind the front. This is where your major rainfall events are going to be, right there at the front boundary and just behind the front boundary. Okay. Now, the warm front, on the other hand, and I don't know if they're going to show it. Ooh, it didn't show it, did it? Okay, it doesn't show it here. Seems like maybe it's out of place. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, there's the warm front. They've, they've got them sort of in, well, no, it's okay. Let's go back to the cold front. This is what happens there. Okay, remember I was saying your weather maker, your rain maker is right here in this part. That's what this one is showing. When I finally will get there. There it is. Look at that cloud. Look at this. Your altitude here is in kilometers. 10 kilometers is about 6 miles up. 15, mi 15 kilometers would be close to uh, 9 miles up. That's way up there. Look at the size of this cloud. It goes from about two kilometers up, which is, you know, 1.2 1, 1 miles up, up to nine miles up. You talk about a vertical cloud here. That's a huge one, okay? And look where the rain is falling, just ahead of the front and slightly behind the front, okay? Enormous rainmaker here, and I guarantee you, these are ice crystals forming up in here, okay? That cold air mass is coming in here, and we'll talk about later how it's producing a counterclockwise spin of air here, okay? Uh, and there's where your major, major thunderstorms. This could easily be one of Roy's supercells, okay? Yeah, okay. Yes, it, it can. That, actually, what you'll be seeing, you'll be seeing this cloud right here along that front, and that's exactly what it would look like. You have to picture yourself as a front view then, you know, looking back at it. Uh, maybe even before it got here, you would be seeing the base of this, and that is your shelf cloud. You're absolutely right there. If that's that well formed, you're in, you're in big trouble. You could be anyway.
exactly right. Now here's what it looks like for the warm front. Now the warm air mass is pushing its way this way. The cold air mass was here. The warm air mass is a, it's not like a bulldozer. You see, the cold air mass is like a bulldozer. It's trying to stay here, pushing the existing warm air up. Whereas the warm air mass, it wants to climb up anyway. So it just claws, just grows over the top of it. And that's why it's a lot more gently sloped. And here your rain event is going to come ahead of the front. This is your warm front here, and the rain is mostly ahead of it. But look at these clouds. They are only going up maybe four kilometers high. Those are still cumulus clouds. Anything that has that flat top on it, those are cumulus clouds really deep like that. But look, they're only from, say, one to four kilometers high. That would be from about uh, six tenths of a mile to two and two and point four to two and a half miles high not really all that tall at all okay and there you're gonna have yeah you can have some thunder and lightning but it's gonna be fairly gentle thunderstorm if that if you can have them up ahead of that or you know further ahead before that happens these are the cirrus clouds i was talking about thin way up in the air clouds uh, these are probably what they call stratosphere, stratus clouds, or stratocumulus clouds uh, as you get down here. Okay. Again, we didn't do that chapter, so don't sweat that. But if you have the book, you want to go back and read it. It's pretty exciting reading. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the cold, the warm front is usually more of a gentle sloping front, so it doesn't produce as heavy of a rainmaker still can be a pretty significant rainmaker and it may go a wider thing here so you may accumulate just about as much rain but it'd be slower gentler rain over a longer period of time this would be warm gulf air coming down over an existing you see at this time of year we don't have that much cold air anywhere anyway so it's going to be oh here's what jacob let me get jacob here before we move any further Jacob. Okay. Welcome in, Jacob. Okay. We're in chapter 23, weather and climate. We're still in the weather part of the chapter. Uh, we're in the part they're talking about air masses and fronts. And this will be basically we're over on about page 580 now in the big book or 23-8 in the smaller versions of those books actually moving over into 581 as well um, now I guess since I have the book in front of me uh, let me show you a couple things that are slightly different in the book from what we've seen on the slide set this I think is a little bit better looking thing of your air masses the other just showed they almost look like little clouds. These show how big and broad the area of those masses are. The the uh, maritime polar, I can't get my finger over there to show it. Tro uh, continental polar, maritime polar, uh, maritime tropical, continental tropical, and maritime tropical. Okay. Uh, then a really nice shot, I thought anyway, of a satellite photograph of a polar air mass moving southeast over the southern U.S. Now, I can't quite make out too much on this uh, to pick up, and the glare is going to be bad. I don't think you can either, but if you got your books, you can look at it. Um, I think that blue in the center of that is, well, I'm showing sort of the center of that, though the glare makes it hard to see. I think it's the Gulf of Mexico. The clouds going down there to the left are, you know, going down Florida, Panhandle, uh, not Panhandle, the peninsula part of Florida. I think that's pretty much what you got. No, I, I was seeing it backwards. Sorry about that. 
just by everything you see there. Okay, I'm sorry. I was looking at it backwards. And again, when I hold it up here, I'm going right to the light. This is Florida right here. This is the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is uh, probably Texas type area. I think Louisiana is somewhere under there. But a, a continental polar air mass has come down pushing the moisture ahead of it back into the Gulf is what they're saying is happening there. Okay. Um, so anyway, I thought it was a pretty neat shot. The Whereas the other, our slide here showed an actual weather map. This shows more of a conceptual weather map. They've just sort of drawn it in. Up here in the uh, uh, Pacific uh, basically the western half of the U.S. is dominated by high pressure which is circular flow of I mean uh, clockwise flow of air and then you have a low down here sitting where is that right off right in Texas it looks like um, would be a counterclockwise flow of air a uh, weak high in sort of the uh, Mississippi Valley there around looks like maybe Missouri somewhere in there but then a low over there in the uh, mid-Atlantic states may have been originally a nor'easter that was um, but you see the areas where the the isobars are closer together that's where your greatest winds will be whether they're fur whether they're fur apart, <laughs> fur apart far apart like there in the western Great Lake area that's a very still day there uh, you'll hardly have any wind at all all right, top of page 581 is talking about a concept that is becoming more and more of a, of a topic, urban heat islands. Now, that sounds like a strange combination of terms there, but I used to experience these when I'd leave campus, especially in the evening. Uh, either this class or my other one when I'd leave uh, let's say December type time frame late November early December when I'd finish my class and get my vehicle to leave and I have a thermometer you know that shows the temperature outside and it might be let's just say 40 degrees when I would get in my vehicle to leave campus now I'm heading it's getting a little later as I drive. It's you know, between 30 and 45 minute drive. This is back in the old days. Okay. Um, I'm heading a little bit north and east. So you would think by going north, this is from Bessemer. I used to teach in Bessemer. Uh, going north and east toward Birmingham. So number one, it was getting later at night. So the temperature should, if anything, be dropping. But it wasn't that much later. And I'm moving slightly north, so if anything, the temperature should be dropping. And I'm also moving slightly east, which, if anything, the temperature should be dropping because the sun set in the east before it sat in the west, right? So it should be dropping. Well, I'd leave Bessemer, and for the first few miles after I got through Bessemer and out going northeast, maybe I would see the temperature drop maybe a degree sometimes not but maybe a degree that would be expected until I got somewhere around Inslee or so and then if it was dropping it would stop and then as I got on into Birmingham the temperature would start rising why is that because I'm in an urban in entering our urban heat island and it may go up two or three degrees from what the coldest was and get warmer okay why well think about an urban area number one got greater concentration of people greater concentration of cars greater concentration of buildings more pavement more parking lots more everything pretty much and just and sometimes maybe a little bit of pollution that basically holds the heat in. 
and you can see that you can sometimes uh, detect that uh, notice that sometime when you're driving uh, from a rural area into a, a, a an urban area if you got a thermometer look and see if you see the thermometer change any now if you're coming right into a rainstorm yeah it's going the other way but on a clear inactive day more than likely you'll see the temperature go up when you go in so it's a nice little blurb there with several question discussion questions if you haven't put chosen a paper topic yet and could find something there that may not be a bad place to look okay now this next little blurb here again is one I don't find all that I can't get it to advance I have to click on the screen before it'll advance there we go waves and cyclones now this is on page 582 in the big book which is 23-10 in the uh, smaller books or might also be in both of them that way waves and cyclone now again their descriptions and explanations I find just a little if not lacking maybe even a little confusing okay so here's what we're talking about the mechanism of these especially the waves the cyclones are going to come later the mechanism of the waves are bulges or waves often formed between oppositely moving air masses so let's say that you have uh, not one's pushing the other out they're both sort of coming in at the same time okay now the bulges or masses or bulges or waves form between these oppositely moving uh, air masses now this is the part I don't think they describe very well they say the overriding uplifted cold air produces a low pressure area okay now this figure I, it really sort of doesn't seem like it makes sense to me okay if you're truly talking about here um, if this is vertical if 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 up is in this direction this doesn't make any sense because I have the warm air coming in underneath the cold air which usually doesn't happen cold air sinks and warm air rises and that's sort of what's happening here now if what they mean this is a you're looking down on it and you have cold air moving one way and warm air moving the other way all right maybe that makes a little more sense but then everything else they seem to be doing here seems to be a vertical shot rather than a horizontal shot so I don't know it like I say, they, this leaves something to be desired. They say the overriding, uplifted cold air produces a low pressure area. Well, number one, cold air usually is overriding and it's not uh, uplifted. It would be drafting downward. Uh, but if indeed this was happening, I could see how that would produce a low pressure area. I guess that's what they're talking about here. I just can't tell what their orientation is here. It's just, I think they haven't done a good job describing it. Now, if this is looking down at it, then the, uh, for some reason, the warm air is pushing up, which kind of makes sense if you're doing this vertically. It would be timing to push up. Then on this side of it, you would have a cold front. On this side of it, it would be a warm front, depending on who's winning in the pushing contest here. It's only going to go one way, okay? But if you have uh, cold air, uh, the warm air pushing the cold air up, and the cold air then coming behind it like this, that would be your cold front on this side. Or if this one was winning, that would be the warm front on this side. Okay. And again, I can't tell what they're talking about so that's how the front forms when the air masses are colliding like this and I take it that means they're just moving past each other like that okay 
Now, if that continues, the warm air pushing upward, the cold air coming down, then you almost get like a water wave here. This would be like a water wave out in the middle of the ocean where it's just a undulating thing. But when you get clear, closer to the beach and then you get the that kind of motion, you could definitely have the cold air pushing down, falling down behind. That makes sense. The warm air pushing up this way. And because the warm air, see again, to me, the warm air pushing up, that makes the low pressure. And it just didn't make sense to say the overriding uplifted cold air produces a low pressure area, except the fact that the warm air is pushing up against it. So I think that's what they must have meant. But again, it's my interpretation of their a little bit less than uh, spectacular description. Okay, well, and then they go into this. And I think this is a just a terrible movement here. They say then you form an occluded front and they really don't give you any good definition of what they're talking about. So you almost have to just go to the book and here's what they say about an occluded front. An occluded front is one that has been, this is on page 582 or 23-10, it's one that has been lifted completely off the ground so again, this now looks like it's a vertical shot here, completely off the ground uh, into the atmosphere. The disturbance is now called, is now a cyclonic storm with a fully developed low pressure area. Here you were sort of developing it, now you've got it. Okay, uh, cold air coming down like this, the warm air circling back this way, so you have very definite circular motion and that produces your low pressure. Low pressure is usually your rainmaker, okay? Because warm air moving up, unstable situation. But now <laughs> to look at this, low pressure moving this way, that's looking down at it again, not looking vertically, but looking horizontal. So again, this is sort of a mystery to me. So this is a low pressure area. Now, if that is too long, too strong of a low, that could actually be a tornado. Not quite that strong, that could definitely be a thunderstorm. Okay? Yes. Oh, how did it happen? We just were going good. Okay. So, let me finish this one slide here. Um, the cyclone would then be the low pressure area with inflowing upward force winds. And that's what's happening here. The, the wind's coming in because of low pressure is rising. The wind's rising. That creates the low pressure. As it goes up, that creates the circular motion in the counterclockwise direction. That circulation pattern is caused by the Coriolis effect. Oh, man. I think we're going to have to start on this one later. There's just too much here. Uh, so let's say we'll start on this slide next time. Let's start with waves and cyclone. That's where I have my mark now, so that's where we'll be. Okay. I did too much talking today. How in the world did it get to be 4.15 so quickly? Okay. Um, just looking ahead, we are still got a few pages of weather. Then we get into climate. Uh, climate isn't quite as long, but it is fairly long, so we're going to be hard pressed to finish this by next time. So we may not get too long a period on the ocean, and that's mostly because we lost most of the class on Wednesday. Sorry about that. All right, let's end that, and we'll stop our slideshow here. And see what else I need to get. Uh-oh, uh I've lost my screen sharing, but I'll come back to that in a minute, okay? So hang tight there. What I want to do now is close this out, if I can, not completely. Here's what I want. I want to go to, let's see, where do I want to go? I know part of what I want is here. Physical science.
is right here. Y'all can't see it, but I know what I'm talking about in here. What we're doing is lab 7. Is that not correct? Is that right? Okay. There's the word part. Okay, let's minimize that. And let's go to the PDF part. Okay, we haven't done this one, right? Okay, number one, can y'all see what I've got here? Probably not. So let me minimize this and minimize that. Now, let's go back to screen share. And okay, I just pulled them in. Where are they? Okay. There's the word part. I don't see it there. Do you? Okay. Yeah. Hold on. Let me get the... Let's see, my word. Go back here again. Okay. Try this one more time. Bring in that. There it is. You probably can't see it yet. Minimize that. And bring in this one, the word part. Okay, let's go back to Zoom. Wrong one, that Zoom. Okay, oh, there it is. I see it now. Wait. Okay. All right, let me try this. Okay. Did it show up that time? Yeah, there it is. There's the word part. Can you see that now? Okay, let's see if I can get the PDF to come up. Okay. There it is. Okay, I got it this time, I think. Can you see the topographic map? Okay, good deal. Okay, now I hope y'all have had a chance. Now let me move some of this stuff out of the way um, because it's going to be in the way if it's not now. And I think I'm going to move y'all. Uh, Valerie, of course, you're in the way again, so I'm going to have to scoot you out of the way. Is that okay? I'm going to do it anyway. Okay. All right. Now you probably couldn't tell any difference there. Now, what we're talking about with topographic maps, and I'm sorry I referred to this today as if we had already done it. Well, I did this a week ago, so I thought we had. Okay, if you think about maps, it shows what's going on, basic features and locations. A road map shows roads, political boundaries like state boundaries, county boundaries, things like that. It shows where the cities are. Where, yeah, you know that. Natural features, rivers, lakes, that kind of stuff. What a topographic map, though, is doing is showing what they call topography, which is, where is, there it is, which is a three-dimensional shape of a surface. Now, it's showing it on a two-dimensional piece of paper, so how is it showing three-dimensional shape of a surface, including the hills, the valleys, the uh, mountains, that kind of stuff, and it usually does show your roads, your buildings, your dams political boundaries. It shows that kind of stuff as well. Okay. Now, we're not going to do this one, but geologic maps show different rock bodies. Actually, something we'll see has a little bit of that in it. I expose that the Earth's surface and frequently includes features found on topographic maps. So we'll see that as we go. Now, most maps are located with respect to the reset. So, okay. 
again, latitude, longitude. I'm not going to read all this. I wanted to hit those things that were highlighted. Okay. I can't, there it is. Can't seem to get my, okay. So a topographic map shows elevation differences by means of contour lines. Okay. All right, I'm going to scoot down one more. Okay. Now, here is a shot. This is supposed to be what we've got. Here looks like it's a bay or something like that, water down here. And the, the, uh, this hill, you can tell here there's been enough erosion here. This is not quite vertical, but almost vertical. Look how steep that is. Now, this is a much more gentle slope here. This is a more gentle slope there. It has a higher elevation, but it takes it longer to get there. Okay. Then you have some more elevation back here. You have a valley in here between these two hills. Well, how does this look on a topographic map? Well, first, the topographic map on the bottom diagram, which let me see if I can get this to scoot down here. Okay, the contour lines are drawn at intervals of 20 feet. Now this is elevation feet, not feet long ways, but upwise. Okay, now I'm going to have to scoot a little bit further down, I think, for you to see this. And this isn't coming across well. Okay, here's your body of water down here. This is at zero altitude because the water is at sea level okay now the first contour line you see here is a 20 foot contour line so therefore it's at 20. the darker lines are at see here's 100 here's 200 okay we'll count how many lines you see in between one two three four five so if divide 100 by 5, you get 20 foot con uh, uh, contour interval. That's what you call it, the contour interval. Okay. Here's that really steep slope that we saw right up here. Notice how close those contour lines are to each other. Between 100 and 200 is just a really short distance there. Here's your 120, 130, 140, 150. No, 120, 140, 160, 180, 200. I mean, they're close together. And same here, after 200, 220, 240, 260, really close together there. 275 is the peak here. Over here, the contour lines are far further apart. Okay, 100 to 200, it's easy to see 20, 40, 60, 80, 200. 20, 40, 60. Now this one, it's hard to see what the, they don't put the peak on it like they did here. It looked like it was taller. Uh, the outside contour line they show here is 260 and it keeps going up. So I would guess that one came close to 280, but that's pretty close too. That's 275. So that's what you've got there. Now, I don't know if you noticed here, there was a little stream that was coming down here. Look at there. You can tell just where that stream went because the contour lines are bending upward here uh, The because the stream basically pulls the, the level down. Okay. Here you have another stream-like area coming here. You probably do here too, but it's hard to see. Those aren't showing too well. But this shoreline was your zero foot contour because that's at sea level, zero elevation. So that's what contour or topographic maps show your contour lines. Contour lines are how far you are above sea level. Okay. Now, this is a most important page right here. Uh, I admit it's not really easy reading, but hopefully you can read it. Uh, they tell you a lot of things about it. Contour line always rejoins itself to form a closed loop 
if you have a big enough map. Some of them may not close because they're outside the map, but if it's within the map area, it always. If you walked along a contour, you would eventually get back to your starting point because you go all the way around the hill or all the way around the valley, okay? Contour lines never split. They never cross. The slopes, if they're evenly spaced contour line, that means that you have a uniform slope. If they're closely spaced, that means you have a real steep slope. Widely spaced, a gentle slope. I don't know why that just turned blue, but it did. Okay. Uh, unevenly spaced, that means irregular slope. Steep, shallow, you know, whatever. Contours usually circle a hilltop. We saw that. Uh, if the hill falls within the map area, the highest point will be inside the innermost contour. We saw that. Uh, okay, and then we saw all these things, so I'll let you do it. Contours always been upstream when they cross valleys. So I'll let you read these. You'll find most of the answers to the first group of questions on this page, on the first page and this page. That's where you'll find most of this information. Don't worry about materials. We're not doing soft clay, okay? We're not doing this procedure here, okay? We're not adding water, using a toothpick, any of that kind of stuff. Lid on strip mine. But here are the results. What do topographic maps show? That was on, I think, the first page. What's the relationship between the closeness of contour lines and steepness of slope? It may have been a little bit on the first page. I know it was on the second page. What happens when contour lines cross a valley? I know that was on the second page. I just read it to you. How would a nearly vertical cliff be represented on a contour map? If it's not specifically stated, there's enough there that you can pull it together. And then question five here, basically finish the whole lab, come back and do that. Okay? Now, I would say just give me a sentence or two, but just let me know what you think about it and it can be positive or negative okay so there's the first part of your lab five questions okay and you get that from the reading on the first two pages okay then invitation to inquiry now here's something you're going to need to do remember the lab when you um, did your latitude and longitude that was one of the last labs you did you had to find the website that would give you the stuff Okay, you got to do it too. It gives you a website here, but at least in a previous class, I was told by some of the students, this is no longer an active website. So you can't, you can try it. See if it got it active again. But if they don't, you know how to search the internet. Here's the keywords to look for. Devil's Tower National Monument might put Wyoming in there too because there's a couple of names that sound similar to each other and what you want is a relief map or topographic map they mean almost the same thing so be sure you get a relief map or a topographic map okay of Devil's Tower National Monument in Wyoming okay so go out and find that for you like I said I not certain this website is still valid. It may be they lost their license or lost the grant. I don't know. Uh, so you might have to go find it on your own. But once you found it, then the first question is, what is the elevation of Devil's Tower? Now, if you can, you can write it right here. If you can't, just put number one down here and write it down here. Or type it however you want to do it. Now, what do we mean by elevation? That's the maximum number you see on that tower. It may be a contour line, and you have to count up and see what contour it is. That's going to be the elevation. What's the contour interval of the map? And on the ones we're going to look at in just a few minutes, you're going to see they're usually printed near the bottom. So look for them. See if you can find them. If not, do the same thing we did on the ones on page one. Find your 100, find your 200. Count the number of lines in between. That divided into 100. There were five lines in between. Divide that into 100, you get 20. 
Those are 20 foot things. They may be measured in meters. I don't know. If they are, then how many meters between the two? So here, don't get, just give me a number. Be sure you put a unit with it as well. Now, number three, what's the approximate height of Devil's Tower? Is that the same as elevation? I can't get my cursor. Where is it? There it is. Okay. Is approximate height the same as elevation? No. What it means by height is find the contour line at the base of Devil's Tower and then find the one near the top of Devil Tower. The difference between those two is your height. It's how far it sticks up from the prevailing ground. Does that make sense? Elevation is how far you are above sea level. Devil's Tower, Wyoming is way above sea level, but the actual tower itself from ground level up, that's not nearly as tall. Okay? So that's what we mean by approximate height. You have to find the contour line near the bottom and find the contour line near the top. The difference between those two is the approximate height. Now, what's the top of Devil's Tower like? Now, it may be that your site that you go to will describe it, but you can look at it and see. And if you see a contour line here, but then a big area in between, you know that in the next 20 feet or 10 meters or whatever it is, there's no change of elevation. So you might say, well, it seems to be relatively flat. They may tell you more than that. Okay. And then the question, is Devil's Tower too steep to hike to the top? Well, you see how close those contour lines are to each other, and you decide whether you want to hike that or not, you know. It may be that they can. I don't know. It may be in the wording you'll find that answer. So those are your next ten questions, uh, next five questions. So you got five on, what was that, page three or four? Five on this page. That's ten. Hey, we need... 25. So we got to come up with at least 15 more questions. Okay? And I'll just scoot you on down here to show you there's nothing else on this page. Okay. See, nothing there. All right. So do you all feel fairly comfortable in how to do this part of your lab? It's about two, th oh, two fifths of your lab. About 40% of your lab is on this part right here. Maybe a little less. Okay. So read the first two pages. Answer the questions on the next two pages. Go to a website and get this one. Okay. Be sure you get a relief map or contour map. Otherwise, you're not going to see contour intervals. You're not going to see contour lines. You're not going to see elevation. You've got to get that. Okay. Now, let's go to the other one. Okay, that's this one. You probably can't see it. Let me pull it up again. That's right here. Okay, now, here we go to a website. Okay, I've listed it here for you. We're going to be going back and forth from the website to these questions. And notice here we have 10 questions there and another 10 here. So that's a total of 20 plus 10 from the other. That gives you 30 questions for your 25 points. So every question is worth a little bit less than that. So let's first go to GSA. That stands for Geological Survey. I don't know if it's of America or Alabama. State, Alabama, U.S., GSA, Geological Survey, Geologic Map. Let's see if I can go straight there. Oops. I can't do it. So what I'm going to have to do is All right, won't go there, will it? All right. I need to get this to a command line. Okay. Copy that to Find a good one. 
do here. Roy, you're in the way again. Okay. Oh, yeah, you are. You know you are. You're always in the way. Let me get out of my, I don't know why I still had that up. You did. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, you want to share it with everybody? Okay. Do y'all hear that? You can go to the chat and get the link for your Devil Sour. Is that the one you're talking about? Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. That way y'all can all use it. By the way, you know, these are labs. If y'all want to chat with each other and do things together in groups, that's what labs are all about. Feel free to do that. Don't feel like you're cheating or something. That's exactly what a lab is supposed to be doing. You're working together. It's just that we can't be together, but that doesn't mean you can't work together. Oh, here's Cormisha. So hold on. I see my screen sharing has stopped. There's Cormisha here. Good deal. Now remind me at 445, I've got to call roll again. Okay. What was I going to do? I was going to type in or copy in, paste in that and go there. Yep, Geological Survey of Alabama. Okay. Now let me get this up on New Share. You have, you, did you look earlier? Okay. All right. Let me just show you what this is all about here. Geological Survey of Alabama. Okay. Um, has lots of good things here. This is sort of your, oh, they have a different name for it. Uh, geologic map. That's not a contour map. This is a contour map you can see those little lines in it make a contour map uh, there's lots of information here we're not going to go over all of it okay um, here again is your geologic map these show the different levels um, here is your mountain ranges that go right through jefferson county there's you know you know red mountain shades mountain you know all those going through here uh, probably down here is maybe Double Oak Mountain, those ranges here. Uh, you see there's sort of plateaus or areas. Actually, this is a lot of mining area here, uh, but probably was plateaus. But you see here's this. Right over here somewhere is would be Mount Chiha. I don't know it on here, but there. But then you have the bands that go like this. Some of these down here are called the Coastal Plain. Um, the wiregrass region, but you see a lot of geologic stuff there. We're not doing that, okay? But there's lots of information here if you wanted to do it. Now, where I tell you to go is down here, and since, like I said, I taught in Bessemer, I chose the Bessemer map. So here we have the Bessemer, and if you go across here, qs20.db, no, I'm sorry, this one, QS20 plate one. That's where I want you to go first. Okay, and that's what your uh, thing says. So you go here to QS20 plate one. All right. Oh, you don't see it. Wait, 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 wait. Let me go back then. I'm sorry, I forgot. I realized. Go back to slide. Wait, let me. Wait, 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 wait. I'll let me go back there. I can't get it to go back there. Again, Cormisha's in the way. I gotta move her out of the way here. Uh, okay. Let me. Oh, here we go. Here we go. I couldn't see it because of that. Okay. Yeah. Can you see that? the screen sharing. Let me make sure I've got it. Uh, this right here. Can you see that? The, the lines on Riverside now. Okay. 
this is what I was talking about before. Can y'all see what I'm scrolling through now? Yes or no? Geological Survey of Alabama. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. So we're, sometimes it loses the screen share and sometimes it doesn't. So this is where I am on that screen share. Okay. This is under this thing right here, GSA slash OGB. It's Geological Survey of Alabama. And I don't know what OGB stands for, whatever it is. That's that site that I gave you. This is where it takes you. Okay. Scroll down here until you get to the quads. Okay. And I just chose Bessemer because that's where I used to teach. Okay. Not in Bessemer anymore. And go here to QS20 plate one. Do you see where my little hand is there? Can you see that? Okay. Now let me also make sure that I'm recording. I think I am. It never ended, but I, it doesn't show up anymore. So I hope I'm still recording. So here's QS plate one. That's what I'm going to click on now and pull it up. Okay. There's the quadrangle map. It's called map 20, plate one. Okay. Now I'm going to go down to the bottom of that. Okay. Moving my thing here, going down to the bottom because the features I want to focus on are going to be down there. Okay. All right. Now near the bottom here, I'm going to expand this a little bit. And you see this plus over here it says zoom in. You see where my cursor is? Right hand corner, lower, lower right corner. You see it? Okay, I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to keep zooming in until it finds it. Whoa, that really zoomed in, didn't it? I lost my corner, so let me scroll. Oh, there, there we are. Okay, can you begin to see this a little better? One of the first questions back on that thing is what's your contour interval? Do you see that down here at the bottom? 20 feet, you got it. Now the contour lines are harder to see. You see these little gray lines here. Those are your contour lines. So I'm going to keep zooming in until I can see those a little clearer, more clearly. Okay. You tell me when, yes. It's time to call roll. Okay, you're absolutely right. My goodness, I got some good timekeepers here. Okay, Don, are you still here? Let me, this will take just a moment. Let me pause for a moment here. Okay, I've got Kermisha still here. That's good because she just got here a short time ago. Okay, I've got David still here. Glad David's still here. Okay, I've got Harry still here. He found the link for us. Good deal. I've got Jacob still here. There's Jacob. I've got Juan still here. There's one. There's another one. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, let's see. Scroll down a little bit. There, Nakaya is still here. Okay, after Nakaya, I've got Roy. Oh, Roy's still here. Wow, amazing. Okay, all right. Roy's always here. Scott's still here. Let me find Scott. There you are. You're hiding, aren't you? Okay, Scott's still here. Thomas is still here. There's Thomas. And let's see who else. Valerie. Oh, Valerie's here. My goodness. My timekeeper. Okay. I think that may be the bottom. Okay. So no other names I saw. Did y'all see any more? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And this shows. Shows 11. I'm the 11th one. Okay. So let me see if I can get this to close out. There we go.
All right. Thanks for calling me. If you see anyone else show up, that'll get them here. Now, what it means so far, I think uh, Capri never made it in for the first part. Bridget never made it in for the first part. Patrick never made it in for the first part. Caitlin never made it in for the first part. Rod never made it in for the first part. And Leon didn't make it in for the first part. Okay. Now, people we've lost, I don't see Don anymore. I don't see Parisha anymore. And the rest of them are here. So if any of those come back, I'm not going to mark them absent until the end but that's where we'll do it okay so y'all are able to follow can you see the uh, lines really well now or you want me to keep bumming up I would say let's do beginning to see them a little bit better okay I'll show you in just a minute you see right here you see the red the next word up would have been mountain you just can't see it because I've done. Here's Shades Valley, I think, here. Okay. So that gives you sort of an idea of where we are. Okay. So let me zoom a little bit more. Did I zoom the right way then? I guess so. Okay. I'm beginning to see the numbers a little bit better. See, there's a 700. Uh, I think probably it could take a little bit more. So let's zoom in a little bit more. Right down here. You see that where my cursor is? Okay. Okay. Uh, some of these are hard. And then when you zoom, sometimes they get harder to read uh, because they get fuzzy. I'm not sure where we are right now. So let me go back toward the bottom. Okay, I get a general idea of where we are now. Scoot over to the right. Okay, now here we are again. It just happenstance that Red Mountain is basically the red color. Okay, uh, okay. Okay. Getting about as far as I can go. Okay. Now, I'm not super familiar with the... I'm going to move Cormisha again. She's in the way again. Let me move them over here. Okay. Um, you can't see what I was just doing. But these are... This basically is part of Red Mountain. The part that goes down toward uh, Bessemer. Okay, it's not as tall. We'll see that a little bit later. Um, but while we're here, there, is, there are a couple features that are showing up on the map I want you to notice. You recognize any words we ran into in the last chapter? There's a syncline. Now, if you look down... So maybe around questions, what, eight or nine or something on there, if you've got that printed out. I don't know if you do or not, but it'll ask for a syncline, and there's a syncline. That's a trough-type area, and sure enough, there's a fault, the Shannon Fault. You all know the town of Shannon, don't you? I don't, not much of a town there, but there's an area there called Shannon. Uh, and let's see, I'm going to scoot down a little more. It seems like there was also, uh, oh, look at what's right in the corner. See that? There's an anticline. That's one of the arch shaped areas. Okay. And the syncline here, you can almost bet the the uh, numbers are, obviously this isn't quite in the right place. It should be following the contours a little bit more. But that would be the minimum contours down here. 
and getting higher this way, whereas the anticline, these are going to be the maximum here and then falling off going the other. It looks like maybe 700, maybe the. So, so that's what it is. There's a, there's a fault, there's a syncline, there's an anticline. Now, synclines and anticlines describe what kind of a um, strain. Remember, a fault is a one type of strain. What's the other kind of strain? A fold, you're exactly right, and that's what a syncline and an anticline are. Those are fold because those didn't break, they just bent. Syncline bending downward, anticline bending upward, arch. Okay, uh, so those are a couple things that are listed there. We'll go back and see later. Let's go back to, let's see again. Valerie, you're in the way again. Goodness gracious, can't you stay out of the way some? Okay, here we go. Let's go back up a little bit here. I felt like I had to show you those. There we had the other part of red was somewhere down here. There's the mountain part. This is Red Mountain somewhere here. Now, let's see. Here I see... A circle here around 900 that would be an elevation here I have a 926 that's going to be one peak there let's see if we get anything that tops 126 926 oops there's a 955 that wins so far do you see that y'all see what I'm talking about Okay, let's see. Y'all tell me if you see any higher than 955. There's one. I can't read it. Is that a 970 something? I don't see the third digit either, but it does. That does look like a 97, doesn't it? Okay. Well hope for that. We'll just call it 970 if we can't see anything else. Ah, you're right. That's probably a water tower on top there. Good eyes there. Okay, so you can stick with the 9. Do you see anything else any taller? Okay. You can either go with 955 if you want that one, or you can go with the 970 if you want to just call it 970. It's 97 something. It's just this number overwrote that one. I don't think zooming out is going to help us any. So on this map, the maximum elevation is around, you could say, 950 to 970, 955 to 970, something around in there. Okay? Now, would that be the height of Red Mountain there? No, that's elevation above sea level. So let's get something sort of at the base of Red Mountain. See if we can find a contour line down there. And I had trouble finding it. There's one that's 700. That's pretty close to the base, wouldn't you say? And on this side, there's a 700. I can get the thing out of the way. That's fairly close to the base. I can't see any numbers much below that. Uh, so you want to just call 700 basically the base of the mountain and 955 or 970 or whatever you want to call that the top. So what's the difference there? What's the, what's the height of Red Mountain there? Something, yeah, between 255 and 270. Perfect. Very good. If you call 700 the base, and that seems like a pretty generally well accepted. There's 700 there, and there's 700 here, and you go much further, and you get higher than 700. So I think that would be it. So 250, 270, something like that. 255, 270, that would be it. Okay, have we answered most of the questions? I don't have both of them up here. 
Uh, let me go back and find the question. Okay. All right. Highest elevation you can read on Red Mountain? I think you answered that one, didn't you? What's the contour interval of the map? You saw that one, didn't you? The lowest contour line you can read near the base of Red Mountain? We saw that, didn't we? Approximate height of Red Mountain on that map? We figured that one out. List at least one syncline found on the map. You found that one. At least one fault found on the map. You found that one. Okay. Now. Oh, okay. We can go back to the map if you want to. Let's look for what else we're looking for. We're going to go to plate two in a minute and find out what kind of fault that was. Okay. We'll go back and find the fault and then we'll do it. And from plate one, it lists at least one anticline. You found that, didn't you? Now, synclines and anticlines suggest what kind of strains? Valerie answered this one. What was that? Folds. Those were folds, not faults. Okay, the fault found in question seven uh, suggests what kind of stresses. Okay, we're going to have to go back and find what kind of fault it was to be able to answer question 10. Because if it was one kind that was a tensional stress, another kind would be a compressional stress. So we're going to have to go find those answers. So we got to first, did someone say we found the fault? <laughs> okay. Uh, you want to go back and look for the fault again, right? So let's go back to Okay. All right. Okay, I'll, I'll head down and do that now. We're going to try to get a couple of birds with one stone here. There's Shades Mountain down there. Okay. Oh, there's another Ishkuda fault system. That's not exactly a fault, but pretty close to it. But let's keep on going. <coughs> Sorry. Do you see the fault yet? Shannon fault. Yeah, Shannon's fault. It's not my fault. No, okay, I'm just kidding. Okay. The Shannon fault. Now, notice what kind of line that is. Kind of a big dash line there. That's what we're going to be looking on the next page. Looks like there's another fault down here, but it doesn't look like we have a name for it. So, the Shannon fault was one of this kind. Okay. Um. So, and then Valerie asked about the contour interval, didn't you? Okay, need to scoot a little bit this way. See right here? You see where my cursor is? error going back and forth contour interval 20 feet okay and then just a memory here Shannon fault remember how that line looks okay all right so let's go back here to GSA OGB and let's then go to Bessemer plate 2 you see where I am Bessemer plate 2, right next to plate 1. Okay, can you all see this on screen sharing still? Okay, good. Okay, I didn't have to change. All right. Now, there's Red Mountain format. You can find all kinds of really interesting stuff here. We're not going to do this. Here shows some of the layering. Looks like some of these are fold some of them are faults possibly you know but look right up here remember what kind of fault we were seeing do i need to blow this up some okay say it again that sure is what it looks like to me doesn't it okay i lost the thing here 
Isn't that what it looked like it was? I can't remember if it was this one or that one, but I would say they're both normal faults. Okay, now you have to remember from the chapter what created the normal faults? What kind of stresses? Tensional stresses. The thrust fault and the, what was the other name for it? Uh, reverse fault and thrust faults were both compressional stresses. What's the difference? You remember between the thrust fault and the reverse fault? They're both. Say again. Yeah, and that was compressional stresses. You're absolutely right. But what's the difference between reverse and thrust? Well, we're, we're not talking about them now, but since they're shown right up here, they don't show a reverse. The thrust faults are very low angle very low angle whereas a reverse fault is a steep angle we don't see any reverse faults on here we didn't see any thrust faults but anyway that was the difference what we saw was normal fault and the stresses were tensional stresses pulling apart and that's what we had so the Shannon fault back on page one of the word document was a a normal fault and then yes what's that you can't okay you can't hear me now no you can see my mouth but you can't hear me talk is that right okay what I'm going to do is unplug okay let me try.